You want a roadmap from start to finish of the entire process of getting that bioinformatics role. Stay tuned on this episode of Genomics with Georgia. Welcome back to the channel or hi if you're new around here. My name's Georgia and I'm a bioinformatician slash biology data scientist and I've been working in this field for over four years now. Let me tell you, I've had my fair share of interviews for junior to mid to senior level roles. I want to share with you guys today my consensus roadmap of applying for a bioinformatics job all the steps you might encounter so that you can feel best prepared when you're going through the process yourself. Before we get into the actual steps of the roadmap, I just want to make it super, super clear that different jobs will have different steps along the way. So they'll probably have most of the steps I'm going to lay out today. They might have fewer if you're lucky, or they might have more or double some of them up if you're unlucky. But this roadmap should give you an idea of the general steps that you will probably encounter along that way from that first initial screening call all the way to the final offer. Without further ado, let's get into today's video. So step one is to have a screening or introduction recall. And this was a really new concept to me back at the beginning, but now let me tell you, I feel like for every job that I've got through the first initial door, I've always had one of these pre-screening calls. So let's just talk through what that actually is. So more often than not, the hiring manager for the role or perhaps their internal HR recruiter will have a preliminary screening call with you before the kind of official interview. And what this means is you're gonna jump on a Zoom call for about 15 to 20 minutes and you're gonna have a screening call. What they're essentially trying to do is just sense check that you are who you say you are on your CV. So there's nothing to be too stressed about, but you just need to make sure that you are familiar with your experiences, obviously that they've been truthful, so you can then discuss them on the call. And it just gives the hiring manager some confidence to, you know, invest the time in you for the interview, because yes, you're putting your time in for this whole long process, but so are they on the other side. So it just makes sure that both parties aren't wasting their time and you are who you say you are and you can kind of proceed to the next step. However, I would counter this with, I've had two occasions where a question in the screening call caught me off guard. So the first one was when I went for an interview at a biotech company and it was for a junior role, but I had about like one and a half years of experience at the time. I thought it was a, well, it was a screening call, jump on for five, 10 minutes. And they started asking me in-depth questions about their technology, I guess to show that I was, you know, invested in the company, but I hadn't done any prep for this call, so it was a car crash. I would definitely advise like read up on the role in the company before you jump into the screening call just in case they ask you questions like that. And then secondly, I had a screening call for a senior position and they asked me in the interview, and it just really took me off guard. It was like, um, well, what kind of role are you looking for in 20 years time? And I don't know, I haven't like, I, I just, it just proper stumped me. I didn't really know what to say. And then they had to kind of prompt me and be like, oh, you know, so do you see yourself like in research at a biotech, like or a big or a small team? I just didn't really have any preconceptions about that. So now I would always have a more articulate answer to give in that environment. So you might get caught off guard at the end of the day. They're just trying to make sure that you're worth taking forward. So as long as you have your CV with you, you've like skimmed it, make sure you've read the job description beforehand. So you can just, you know, briefly chat about your experiences and what you're excited about for the role. But it's really just a chance for the hiring manager to be like, I'll take them to an interview. After you've been able to move forward from being a name on a paper to putting a face to the name, you're in that section. Next is step number two, which is the technical test. And this is essential. You can't do a bioinformatics role without showing them that you're capable of doing the technical stuff. But technical tests can come in so many different formats and they can be really stressful when you haven't done many of them. But Lucky for you guys, I've been applying to a lot of jobs in my time, so I have a lot of experience in technical tests. And what I would actually say is applying to jobs is such a good learning experience because the more technical tests that you do, the more familiar you become with the process 
and the less daunting they become. Just apply to things and do these tests because that's how you're going to learn. I've done a brief video on the formats of technical tests that you can check out in the little box up there. But essentially, these technical tests are really important because they're going to make sure that the, you can do the job that you're going to be hired to do. So more often than not, they might be related to the data type that you're working with. Technical tests might be done before the panel interview that's coming up or it might happen during the interview. So let's just touch on briefly if it happens before the interview. This will probably be a situation where they'll give you a technical test to do at home prior to the actual panel interview. And this could be a variety of different things. It could be a bunch of questions to take away and do at home. It could be some sort of data challenge. So they give you a data set and you have to do some analysis on it. Recently, I had a chat GPT technical test where they gave me some chat GPT code and I had to write a code review on that. So there's many different take home ones that you can do. And I'll try and do some more videos in a little bit more depth about those, but you essentially get some time to code at home. More often than not, they'll tell you how long you should spend on the test and then you can then discuss said test in the next stage, which is the panel interview. The panel interview, step three, is what you can think of as the kind of main real interview. There'll be a panel of people that are going to be giving you a more formal interview. Traditionally, this happens in person. However, with hybrid working this can happen online in a in a teams or a zoom setting but essentially you'll have a hiring manager and then a bunch of other key stakeholders in the team or the department or kind of related to this role that you're applying to and they're going to be there and they're going to be doing a variety of things in this panel interview so the panel interview normally lasts around an hour or an hour and a half it can kind of encapsulate these three main bits and again remember that yours might have some of these or all of them or double up on a few but generally the panel interview contains the following the first thing you'll do in the panel interview is review or discuss your technical test so, so you might have had to have submitted the code for the technical test before, or you might have to present the technical test in the interview, but a section of your panel interview will be dedicated to discussing that technical test. So in order to best prepare for that, you need to make sure that prior to you going into the interview, you haven't just brushed up on your experience. Revise what you submitted for the technical test so that when they ask you questions about your rationale, why you used a certain approach, you can then answer that effectively. Or if you have the technical test in the interview, then this is when this will occur. They'll give you, they might give you maybe multiple choice questions to answer and say, you know, is this bit of code wrong or is this bit of code wrong? You might do a live coding thing on one of the kind of platforms like HackerRank, or you might have to do some sort of problem solving challenge where they say, hey, if we gave you this data set, can you write on pseudocode on this whiteboard how you would go about solving the problem? So there's a slot in the panel interview that's dedicated to the technical test. So depending on the format of what yours has taken, then this will be in the interview in the panel interview. One thing I'd really make sure that you do in this section is it doesn't matter if what you've done you regret or you could have done better. You don't need to die on your sword here. You need to just discuss and critique, you know, oh, I did use this approach, but actually on reflection, I now know I could have done this or this is why I did this, but like, I'm not sure if it's the best way to do something. It's part of being a data scientist is about being a problem solver who is collaborative and open to criticism. So if you can show this in the interview through the technical test, then that's just a good way to get that skill over to the recruitment team. So after the technical test, you may have a section in the interview that is another presentation from you. So you might be asked to present perhaps your career history, your experience to the panel, or you might be asked to present on a certain topic and they might give you a few options for the topic or they might just give you one topic nine times out of ten all these topics are going to be related to the role so you should be able to do the presentation 
um, if you're suitable for the role. This part of the interview is just a really good chance for you to demonstrate your presentation skills because again, part of being a good buyer for petition is communicating narratives, telling stories. So let this be the time in the interview that you can show that skill to the hiring panel. It also allows you to demonstrate your technical competencies. So if you're doing a more personal career presentation, you can really highlight the things that you've done that are relevant to this role and really get across your passion and energy for the field. And then on the alternative side, if you have to do a presentation on something technical related to the role, again, you get to really demonstrate how well you can understand a topic and then discuss it in layman terms with maybe non-expert audiences. And then finally, the kind of third part of the panel interview will be the competency-based questions. So. This is basically where they ask you a bunch of questions to evaluate who you would be as their new hire. So it's trying to, you know, really dig out those things. You know, how do you interact in a team? How do you work under pressure? How do you resolve conflicts? It's really trying to make sure that you would fit in well in the team and that you can display these really important roles and values. There's a bunch of competency questions you can find online if you just Google, but the one advice that I always say, and I actually like watched this on a YouTube video years ago, it was to basically have your, you have your little treasure box of your experiences and you, you should kind of like condense all your experiences into like bits of treasure in your treasure box so that when someone asks you a question, you can pull out a bit of treasure from your treasure box and you can relate it to kind of different competency questions. You might have one, say your undergraduate research thesis project, right? Or your master's thesis, that could be an item of treasure in your treasure box. And just make sure you kind of have like a few key things that you feel really proud of in that experience. And then when someone asks you a question, you'll be able to tailor that little bit of treasure to multiple different questions. So name a time when you led a project on your own to completion. How did you plan for it? And then what were the, the outputs? That piece of treasure, your thesis, could answer that question. Or you might have one that says, name a time when you had to learn new skills that you'd never had to a high standard. And how did you go about seeking those new skills? Well, you could pick the master's thesis up again from the treasure box um, and say that, you know, you had to like connect with people in the team and like go out and find resources, etc. So have like bits of treasure in your treasure box and then be able to relate them to different questions that might come up. Because I think it's really easy sometimes in these scenarios to use the same example for lots of different questions or even like examples from the same experience for lots of different questions. I think it's better if you can use a variety of your experiences to answer those competency questions so that you you can really show them more of who you are rather than just everything from your master's thesis. You know, if you had a voluntary job or if you had an internship or even something in your undergrad, you know, if you can show examples from different experiences, it's just a good way of giving them the whole story of you rather than just one little bit. And just when you think the panel interview has ended, they're gonna ask you, do you have any questions for us now? And this is so, so important um, because it's your chance to ask some things that you really should be thinking about before looking at a position. So it's their chance to see how well you ask questions. And as I'm sure we know, being a good data scientist is all about questioning and challenging and being curious, right? So asking a question at the end of an interview is like an imperative thing to do to show that you are someone who can communicate. So just make sure that you've got some questions in the bank ready to ask them. The next stage in this uh, very long process is meeting the team. It might happen if it does in the interview process. So the team might be invited to the interview or they might be joining the room after the kind of panel questioning is finished. Or you might be escorted out by some of the team and given a tour around the building if it's in person. So it really can kind of vary. A lot of teams will want you to meet the team. And this is important for two reasons. So the first reason is because 
as much as you are being interviewed, it's also your chance to interview them. You need to be really sure that you would want this job. It's so easy to just say yes to something because you've been offered it, but if you don't understand what the team are like and the dynamic and the structure, it can be a real shock if you go into a job without that prior understanding. So it's just really important for you to get a grasp of, are people happy there? You know, how long have people been in the team? If it's backfilling of a role, you know, why did the previous person leave? It's really important to get an idea of that for yourself so you can have a, a good enough good as you can picture of the team that you're joining. Also, the interview isn't over yet for you either. So they're interviewing you, right? Like, even though you're having a chat with them, they're going to be asked for their feedback on their impression of you. And this is basically, you know, did they like you, which is obviously an illegal hiring process. That's why it's like, oh, you meet the team, but actually like the team are sussing you out. So you still need to present yourself well, ask interesting questions, seem engaged by the role, and just remember that you are still on show. I remember I, I did like a meet the team once and I think I got too relaxed and I kind of was chatting to them like they were my friends rather than like I was at an interview. So I think it can, you need to still like remain professional, you know? And then finally, when you've met the team and you think it's all over, um, it might not be. So if there were any key people related to the role that weren't available during your panel interview, you might have to find time to then meet with them so they can have met you before the decision is made. So you might still have to meet people who are related to the role if they have been away on holiday or weren't able to be at your panel interview. So bear that in mind, it might not be over yet. And then after all of that, you can breathe. <laughs> um, it's like so many steps, honestly, to get from putting your CV in to getting to the place where you finished the panel interview. You might even have a technical test that's multiple stages. You might have a pre-technical test, then you might have a real technical test, or you might have a three-stage technical test. So like, if you have all of these chunks, it really can add up to a long process. So it's really important to be aware of all these little things that you can encounter when applying for these positions step is then being contacted by HR or the recruitment team about the result of your interview. If things don't go well, then it sucks, but just be proud that you got that far. Hopefully they'll give you some feedback about why you didn't quite make the cut. Give you feedback, ask for it, because if you've made it that far, there probably aren't many of you, so it would be quite easy for them to give you some feedback and that can really help you understand how you can do better next time or just the unfortunate circumstances of why you weren't the one for that role. But on the other hand, they might tell you that you got the job. That's when you start entering into your package negotiations which we can discuss another time, but exciting to get to that point. And then you've got your new job. Obviously there's more people applying than there are roles. So more likely than not, you will end up dropping off at one point in this very long process. But just, just remember every interview that you do, even your first interview that you might balls up completely, is such good experience and it means that when you get the next one you're going to do better and then every time you're going to keep bettering your interview practice and then before you know it you're going to swan into an interview with no nerves and show up the best version of you and then if they don't want you then you're okay because you know that you sold yourself authentically and well so that's it for today's video. I hope you found it helpful to see this kind of overview from start to finish of all the processes you'll have to go through, all the hoops you need to jump through to get a bioinformatics rock. My name's Georgia, this has been Genomics with Georgia, and I hope to see you again on another video. Bye!